Hello and good morning. Thank you so much for joining me for Daily Spark with Dr. Angela. I'm your host, Dr. Angela Chester. You know what we like to do on my show, enlighten, inspire, and empower you to become your best. Scripture reminds us that the tongue is a small thing that makes grand speeches, but a tiny spark can set a great forest on fire. And today I have an author on that I think is going to allow you to look at your world from a totally different perspective. My guest today is B.K. Matri, and he is out of the Texas area. We are chatting with an alien. Well, let me tell you a little bit more about BK. After visiting the U.S. for the first time, he wrote an email to his friends and family about his experiences, which they thoroughly enjoyed. This inspired BK to pen this book. While pursuing the American dream, BK went through many interesting experiences. Some of the incidences in the book were experienced by the author and his friends and the rest are purely fictional. Well, those born and brought up in the U.S., BK says, you guys don't experience America the way that someone fresh off the boat does. Well, BK portrays America through the eyes of an immigrant, an alien, if you would, indulging at times in satire. So that's right. We are chatting with the alien today and I love that he uses that expression because it does kind of in a way allow us to look at the world through his eyes. His book is about an immigrant's experience in America which deals with the cultural differences, the subtle differences in language, and the other day-to-day experiences that perhaps we have taken for granted. Um, Nicely though, he has woven this into a storyline in a romantic fiction format. The book is engrossing, entertaining, romantic, and emotional as we somewhat and some somewhat educational parts as well. So let's go on and bring BK on. Hello, good morning, BK. How are you? Thank you so much for joining me on Daily Spark today. Hi, Dr. Angela. First of all, thanks for having me and having me to uh, let you talk to your audience on your show. I'm excited as you are, and I guess my audience is Yes, I love it. I love having a fellow author on. Uh, I know that writing books is something that comes easy to some people. It may not come easy to others. So anytime I can um, have someone on and they can talk about the experience as well as sharing a bit of their life, it's always fun and exciting for me. Well, that's my first question for you, BK, and that is what inspired you to write this book? Well, uh, uh, first of all, that's a very interesting question, and uh, I would, you know, I would like to answer it by saying that, you know, one day I was just traveling uh, to work. I don't know if I was driving or in a train, and I was thinking about, by the time I had spent about 15, 16 years in America as an immigrant, and I was thinking that there are so many experiences I gathered during those um, number of years in in U.S., in different parts of U.S. I was in first uh, in New York State area, then I was in Louisiana, and now I'm in Texas. So then I thought that maybe I should write about my experiences. Uh, the question was, uh, how do I write it, in which form? And I wasn't sure because, you know, I'm a first-time author. I've never written any books other than small articles and letters to editor. Uh, then I thought about maybe a blog, a short stories. But both these ideas didn't sound very exciting to me. I mean, I don't, I don't read blogs. I, I know people uh, are followers of some, uh, you know, blogs very uh, religiously, but I am not one of those. Short stories is again, uh, it's going to be like different incidences and different stories, not woven together. Then I thought about uh, if I can put all the experiences in the form of a fiction, a romantic fiction, or a novel, that would be really great, and that's what. I started thinking about that idea literally when I was going to work and then uh, thought maybe novel is a better idea, maybe a fiction, maybe even a better idea is romantic fiction. So uh, I started thinking about it. I had some basic idea as to what I'm going to write. I thought of a fictional character, uh, which is in the book, which is, of course, Manhattan Alien. And uh, that character is kind of based on myself. And... um, 
a friend in New York who still lives in Manhattan. And then I thought about the basic storyline and a basic concept of the idea. And then when I came home, I don't know if it was the same day or the next day, I opened my laptop and started open, you know, uh, whatever software you use, Microsoft Word or Pages. And I started writing and I kept on writing and writing because the ideas just mm-hmm. came through and one thing led to another, uh, although I had basic concept of what, what I was going to write. So mm-hmm. basically that's how uh, the book Manhattan Alien was born. Mm-hmm. Now, I I like that title. The, the title is, is very interesting. So I'm sure someone's going to ask, uh, well, is this, is it, a little bit of science fiction kind of mixed in there, or is it purely um, a romantic style? Yeah, that's an interesting question. Yeah, the title is can be sometimes very deceiving or deceptive. Now, the title is Manhattan Alien. One thing I was sure when I started writing this book was the the book will be based the the book the character and the book stories will be based in New York. There is no question about it. So <laughs> that's how the first part of the book title comes, Manhattan. And mm-hmm. the second part is very interesting. It sounds like somebody from outer space or some other galaxy landing into Manhattan, and the the book is about some alien living in Manhattan. That that is not correct. This is not a sci-fi <laughs> at all. <laughs> well, the the real story is when immigrants like me come to this country uh, on, a, on a visa, on a work visa or whatever student visa, they are called non-resident aliens. So uh, in my opinion and for general public, alien is the term reserved only for people who are from different planets or galaxy or from outer space, not mm-hmm. for uh, somebody coming from other country or you know other region. Okay. So that is how the title, second part of the title comes. And what happens to the immigrants is when they stay here, and uh, most of them, not all of them, want to stay here forever. You know, they want to acquire the citizenship and want to become a naturalized U.S. citizen. But what is interesting is the whole process is pretty long and tedious. You have to go through a number of visas, and you have to file your papers, and then eventually when you become a green card holder or permanent resident still you are called resident alien believe me or not so Hmm. that alien title does not yes the alien title does not go away and finally when that day comes when you become naturalized citizen you Mm -hmm. go to the you know that big hall and take the oath Mm -hmm. then you become a a naturalized u.s citizen and then you get rid of the title alien so uh, this process will take you know, n number of years, depending on how you came, what visa you came, what kind of education mm-hmm. you have, and it, it takes about anywhere between eight to ten to fifteen years. Wow. Okay. Yeah. One thing I was going to say that uh, I was just recently in in uh, Bombay, India. I was talking to some of my uh, classmates and uh, other friends whose kids are here for studying, and when I told mm-hmm. him about this book. Uh, even they did not know that um, the immigrants are called aliens. Uh, uh, some of them actually were surprised. So I had to pull up thing on my mm-hmm. phone, you know, on the Google and show them that, yeah, see, this is the title, now the resident alien. Mm-hmm. And when you become green card holder, you become resident alien. So even they were surprised. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it's uh, it, it's probably something that you hear it, on the news or you may hear it in passing but you it doesn't really click in your head that you're you're having this conversation about an individual because it's something that you don't hear on on a on a day-to-day basis in 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 day-to-day uh conversation and it really does cause you a moment of pause because I don't think that, like you said, you know, if if you were born here or or raised in the U.S., there's some things that you're you're just kind of ignorant of of that of the information, and I don't think people realize that. I had I had no idea, especially the green card portion. I would have I would have mm-hmm. thought that that the name itself changed at that moment because you had um, a more permanent status. That's that's interesting. Thank you so much for sharing that because it is important that people that people know. So in your in your book, 
Um, do you include some of this in the in the basic storyline, or or how do you um, incorporate the the fact that there's this immigrant or this alien that's in Manhattan? Yeah, so basically my story is about this immigrant and, you know, subtle differences in the culture, the way we speak. You know, growing up in India, uh, as you know, and as everybody knows, India was ruled by uh, Britishers for a long time. Uh, one of the reasons we are very fluent in English is because, because of the British rule. And But the problem is we, sp- we speak British English. So sometimes yes. uh-huh. that can be funny. <laughs> Or it can be, you can feel, or somebody else can feel out of place that, hey, this guy is talking something different. Mm -hmm. So that was one of the things. And uh, the basic storyline of my book is basically an alien or immigrant who is actually a young doctor in this case. He lands in New York and he gets uh, a job in one of the hospitals as a research fellow or a research doctor. Uh, I don't know if you know, but typically research fellows or research doctors are not paid very well. So, Mm -hmm. yeah, so he accepts this job because he sees himself having a bright future. He can do something in future in in the country. Mm -hmm. And uh, since he has spent most of his adult life in Bombay, India, by the way, Bombay is one of the the biggest and uh, the the highly populated city. And this is the city which comes pretty close to New York in terms of lifestyle. Mm -hmm. But... Having said that, there are subtle differences in culture, language, and day-to-day life. Of course, now the things have quite a bit changed since I have left India because since, since I left India, you know, it's, um, there are many American shops and eateries mm-hmm. and coffee shops which are open in, in India. So slowly and slowly, India is also getting more westernized or Americanized. But mm-hmm. when I came here, uh, my life, uh, which I spent uh, most of the time in Bombay, um, and when I came here, I found that, oh, this is a little bit different. And mm-hmm. this is how the story starts, uh, the way I came here. And then uh, this research fellow, the character in the book, he meets a young female medical student. And she realizes during conversation that this guy, this doctor is very smart, but mm-hmm. academically smart. He's not street smart. So she <laughs> says, okay, mm-hmm. I can fix that. I can teach you how to live in America, how to talk to girls, how to what to Mm -hmm. say, what not to say, and uh, you teach me the research part, and, you know, we have sort of a contract so Mm -hmm. that, you know, I'll teach you the American way of life, and you teach me the academic part of what we are doing. So Mm -hmm. that is is the basic storyline. That sounds really interesting, because, you know, I, I can... I can see how that would apply to uh, people that live in a small place, um, you know, your town, mm-hmm. USA, and then they move to the city. You know, mm-hmm. you move to a Chicago, a New York, a L.A., a Miami, and you do feel a, a little bit out of place or there's a bit of a culture shock, even though you're an American in America, you're still not in your comfort zone. And what a what a lovely way of saying, hey, you do have to be street smart. You do need to realize that you're in a different place and, and how do you stay safe? Um, but let's do this mutual exchange. That's, that's awesome. And I think that that would really um, – that's really going to do well with with everyone, um, regardless of of um, your status or your ethnicity. That was really ingenious, BK. I like that. I like that. Well, listeners, don't go anywhere. We need to take a very short break, but when we get back, we will definitely continue my conversation with BK Matri, and he is an author out of the Texas area, and he has a wonderful book called Manhattan Alien. We'll be back right after this. And we are back. Thank you so much for joining me for Daily Spark with Dr. Angela. I'm your host, Dr. Angela Chester. Today we are talking to B.K. Matri. He's out of the Texas area, and he is the author of Manhattan Alien. So, B.K., who would you say is the target audience for your book? Well, that's a very interesting question because there is... There is, and there is no such target audience for my book. The book is about an immigrant's life. And if you talk about the age groups in general, I would say anybody from 
teenager to you know as old as 80 90 year old can read and mm-hmm. enjoy the book so as far as age is concerned uh, i would say it's a very wide range of audience um uh, mm-hmm. this book particularly will be loved and liked by immigrants mainly from asia like india pakistan china uh, sri lanka wherever they come from uh, in fact in fact i was uh, recently in bombay and some of my friends read this book and actually some of those friends had never immigrated to any other country they you know they lived they stayed in bombay forever but even then they found this book very interesting so i found it very interesting because uh, these people have never experienced how to live like an immigrant in a foreign land and even mm-hmm. then uh, they loved my book also mm-hmm. um some of my friends who are here like me in US for 10 15 20 years they also loved the book because they could tell me that oh this incident which you wrote in the book this happened with me or oh what you mentioned mm-hmm. in the book exactly mm-hmm. same thing happened with me so they could relate mm-hmm. to it uh and what is more interesting is um even the people who are not immigrants like me uh, or you know who are locally born and brought up they would also find this book interesting because it gives them a different perspective so mm-hmm. as as i said to summarize there is no target audience anybody and everybody will love the book immigrants particularly would love the book more because they have gone through the same process which i have gone through and they could kind of relive what has happened to them or could relate mm-hmm. to some of the incidents in the book mhm and i'm i'm so glad that you that you explained it that way because I think you're right. Everyone is going to have their own perspective, their own understanding of of um what the book is. And surprisingly in this um you know when you read a book, the wonderful thing is is that if you set it down and you read it months later or if you even read it years later, you have a totally different understanding, a different point of view about it, and it becomes a brand new book all over again. So that's that's really wonderful that you could read it at various stages of your life and and still be um informed and entertained at the same time. Mm-hmm. Now, when you write about um about the overall story and and we understand that, you know, part of it is about your experience, but some of it is fiction as well. Um do you touch on any social aspects? Do you choose to focus on any um particular topics? specifically Yeah I mean there are a lot of social issues that are dealt with some of them very subtly and some of some of them very obviously one of the main issues which uh, of course is the title of the book is uh, the alien I find mm-hmm. that extremely uh, I don't want to say like but kind of derogatory to call somebody from other country an alien as if you are coming from an outer mm-hmm. space and you don't belong here so mm-hmm. if 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 somebody would give us a better title now i i have got rid of the title uh, as as i told you earlier so i have no mm-hmm. more an alien but i feel bad for all those people who are coming after me and i have been mm-hmm. you know here for a number of years and they are called they say an alien or not they say aliens so that's mm-hmm. that's that's kind of a funny way of looking at it also i have not talked directly about it in the book mm-hmm. but kind of mentioned it and uh, uh that's that's the main social issue i've dealt with and there are some other issues i've dealt in the book but they are in a very subtle way and uh, i don't want to give out too much to the audience okay. because uh, <laughs> they would like to read the book and uh, you know experience themselves mm-hmm. uh, and i'm i could have written it more uh, crude way or not subtle way but the thing is I don't like to incite any passions or any rages among the audience. Uh mm-hmm. some of the facts I've just presented and left it like incomplete if I can say that. Mm-hmm. And the, the readers or the audience have to read the book and make an inference from what I'm trying mm-hmm. to say or what what's the social mm-hmm. issue I've dealt with. But there are many issues which immigrants face uh throughout their, you know, life as an immigrant and uh, that that is not experienced by by the locals or those who are born here and brought up here mm-hmm. so mm-hmm. um uh, i would encourage audience to you know read the book and um, experience themselves what i have dealt with mhm now 
even though you're writing the book from um, the perspective or the eyes of an immigrant, um, what do you think is is the appeal for the American reader, for the American audience? Yeah, it's it's as I said earlier, there is no specific target audience. Although um, immigrants from India, Asia would like uh, to read the book and experience, you know, what what I have written and uh, read it. Uh, what is funny is some of my American friends, including uh, some in Texas, have read the book and have complimented me. So uh, the reason why American audience also would like the uh, the book because it's looking at the same thing which you have been, you know, uh, living since your birth and looking at uh, things around you. Uh, how does an immigrant look at those things in a different way? Mm-hmm. And uh, that will be an interesting experience because it will give them a different perspective. And uh, uh, basically, uh, something which they assume are uh, in a day to day life, like buying a coffee, there is an incident in the book of buying coffee in the Starbucks where the character gets confused because, uh, as I said, when I immigrated, there was no Starbucks in India, now they are. But mm-hmm. he didn't know different types of coffees and how to order mm-hmm. coffee. So it's a very interesting uh, incident in the book. And a lot of people, they actually called me, like my American friends, and they said, hey, we never knew that. You know, this can be so confusing because mm-hmm. we have been going to Starbucks since childhood, so we know what to order. <laughs> uh, ordering coffee should not be such a problem. But it actually did happen with me, and I was thoroughly confused when I looked at the menu, and I ordered some drink, and it was a total disaster. So, um, yeah. again, I would, I would not give out too much details, but... These are like mm. subtle, subtle things in the book, and uh, uh, American audience will, our readers would find them very interesting because uh, mm-hmm. this gives them a different perspective altogether. Mm-hmm. When you when you mentioned the the Starbucks comment, I am pretty sure some people nodded their heads on that one and said yes, because I know some folks that have never gone to Starbucks before, and. Ordering at Starbucks is an experience. You do have to kind of know what you're doing in order to hurry and get through the line. Once, once you know and you figured out the rhythm of how it works, then, then you're, you're totally fine. But the first time, and, and I think everyone who, um, I'm a Starbucks drinker, so um, the first mm-hmm. time you are a little nervous. And you're you're not sure, you know. Uh, you, you just want a small coffee. You don't know anything about this tall or vente or or anything else. And it's like, what? What? What is this? So, I can imagine. Yeah. I can imagine that that's that's that story. I think is something like you said is going to uh, be across the board, and everyone is going to be able to laugh at that one, especially. No, yeah, I, um, I know. Go ahead. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's funny that you mentioned that because recently, as I told you, recently in January, I was in India and we went to meet a friend of mine and his mother was unfortunately admitted in the hospital, was not doing well. And we went downstairs and, you know, in the hospital in the cafeteria and he ordered two coffees. Mm-hmm. And he ordered two coffees, got two coffees. He didn't ask me what size you want. Do you want skim milk? Do you want this? Do you want that? I said, I like that. He said, when I go to Starbucks... Hey, you have to have the Starbucks lingo. You, you have to know what skinny means, what tall means, what venti means. And if you don't know, you will be thoroughly confused. But I like that when you order coffee, you get coffee. Just one type of coffee, but that's it. I love it. Yes, that is that is so true. And it is it is definitely, um, it is an experience, I, I tell you. And it's, it's, it's really funny. Because I know the first time, um, I was trying to listen. You know, what are other people getting? What what is they're having this conversation and mm-hmm. it, it it seems like it's really taking not too long, but just longer than, than usual. Like you said, I wanna I want a small coffee, you know, and they just give it you black brewed coffee. But there was an exchange going on there and that kind of uh oh, maybe I should listen in. What's what's really happening? So yes, definitely, definitely have to learn the lingo. It it should be a webinar or a class for, you know, Starbucks 
ordering 101. I, I agree with you on that one. Now, I know, again, uh, without giving away any spoilers, and listeners, you guys know, we're not going to tell you everything. You definitely have to go and pick up your own copy of the book. But, BK, I want to ask you, with everything that's going on in the world, and I, you really, really touched on something when you said um, using the word alien versus the word immigrant. Um, do you think that there are some, some lessons that people could get out of your book, especially considering the um, political climate that we have going on and not getting too political or, you know, or anything like that? And without telling too many spoilers, but but do you think that that this your book could be used in a way to open up the dialogue or to have a better understanding? Yeah, that's a very important uh, question. I'm glad you asked it, and uh, you know I'm more than happy to answer your question. Uh, first of all, let me uh, say a few facts, and I'm strictly talking about uh, legal in- immigrants uh, who are coming to this country. I'm not talking about uh, other other groups right, of course. Mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. so all of the Lima immigrants, including myself, who come to United States have they come for two main purposes. Number one is, and that's most important, is how my skills or our skills can be useful in this country for the betterment of the United States. That's the first thing, and that is that is why uh, we are not invited here, but we are we go through a legal process. We are given a visa, and we are thoroughly checked, and that's. That's how we land here. Whether you get a job as a research fellow, as a doctor, as a fellow or resident, or as an engineer or as an IT professional. But that is the first thing which immigrants have in mind that how can I be useful to the United States and how can I be useful my skills to the people in this country? Mm-hmm. That is the first part. And the second part is, of course, immigrants come here for what? Better life, better education for their kids, better prospects and better uh, living conditions. Mm -hmm. Uh, And one other thing I would like to talk to your audience and tell them um, in particular is most of the immigrants who come here, they want to assimilate within American life, American culture. Mm -hmm. At the same time, they want to preserve their own identity where they come from, you know, Mm -hmm. the culture, the religion, or where whichever part of India or any other country they come from. So it's kind of a, biophysics process, uh, you want to accumulate and assimilate in the American people in day-to-day life, but at the same time, you don't want to lose too much of your own identity and culture. Uh, other thing is, uh, particularly since you asked me, given the current political climate and sort of uh, negative approach towards immigrants, is I would say that if you look at the past, present, and future, uh, America has been greatly benefited by skills and intelligence of and expertise of the immigrants. Let it be IT field, let it be doctors, let it be you know any other field, mm-hmm. and that will that is continue to going to happen. So it is a it is a win win situation for both America Americans as well as immigrants that we come here, we give our skills, make our lives better, but at the same time, our skills and intelligence are utilized in this country to the best and other other people's lives also gets better. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. in my in my opinion to summarize basically, uh, I would like to say that uh, immigrants who come here are come with great enthusiasm. Most of them are hard working and extremely intelligent. And mm-hmm. um, so the, the the approach towards immigrants should be the immigrants should be viewed as friends or brothers from other countries not somebody mm-hmm. who's come to take my job or, you know, uh, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. things like that. And uh, basically, they have come for betterment of their lives as well as Americans. And they should be treated with love and passion, not hatred. That's mm-hmm. my opinion. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. No, I think that you've made a, a really, really good a really good point there is that um, I think people forget they get caught up in the rhetoric. They get caught up in the, um, the, the hate speech sometimes, and mm-hmm. we, we, lose, we lose our identity or we, we lose our, our spiritual selves in, in, the, 
in the hate speech of it all. And if we kind of just take a moment to uh, ask ourselves, if it were us, what would we want to happen? So I can I can understand that. And like you said, you the people that are coming on the visas and all of that are bringing a skill set that is going to um, be better for everyone. And and I think that people will nod their heads on that and say, yes, I want a I want a professor that's awesome. I want a coworker who's going to make a difference. That we are we are going to be awesome as a team. And 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 continue shining that light. What a, what a wonderful point that you made there, BK. Thank you so much for reminding us of that. Well, listeners, we need to take a very short break, but when we get back, we will continue our conversation about this wonderful book, Manhattan Alien, that has been written by BK Matri. We'll be back right after this. And we are back. Thank you so much for joining me for Daily Spark with Dr. Angela. My guest today is B.K. Matri. He is the author of Manhattan Alien. And we are having such a wonderful conversation about all of these experiences that he has had and the process that you go through to become naturalized but the terminology that's used along the way. And as someone who is American-born, as he says, we don't always get it. We don't always understand uh, what the process is and how coming to this country um, is an experience and it's something that can definitely be shared and appreciated by those of us who are American-born. So, BK, how much of the story is based, or how much of your book is based off of your own life's experiences? Uh, I'm glad you asked that. Uh, in a very short answer, is very little. Um, uh, it's really funny because uh, before I answer your question, let me tell you a story. Uh, a friend of mine in India, uh, he, he got this book online and he read it, and then he, when he finished it, he sent me a message saying that, oh, I love your book and, you know, you've done a wonderful job. And mm-hmm. then uh, he asked me that, are you so-and-so and have you married to this person and do you have the kind of kids you have talked in the book? So he, he th- almost thought that <laughs> it's, it's my real life story, uh, which mm-hmm. is, of course, not true. So mm-hmm. to, anyway, back back to your question is, uh, uh, it's it's very little part of the book is, uh, kind of I've, what I've experienced, but it does start the way I came here in the United States and around the same time I came here. I came around in, in the beginning of the millennium, around 2000. Mm-hmm. And uh, I would say that uh, about less than 5% of the book, particularly the beginning, is, is based on uh, how I came here because uh, when I started writing the book, I didn't have to imagine something or um, create something. I just wrote... Uh, the experiences uh, which uh, I went through. I came to New York, of course, and I was staying in New Jersey with a friend of mine. And the mm-hmm. way I've described in the book, of course, the names and the places have changed a little bit. But uh, uh, what is interesting is over the last um, many years, a lot of friends I met, and they tell me, told me their experiences. And uh, mm-hmm. at that point, I was not trying to write any book or any story or anything. But when I started writing this book, I thought, oh, this particular guy said something, this funny thing happened with him, and mm-hmm. uh, which typically happens with immigrants. I can include that. And some other guy, some incident happened in the uh, shopping mall, um, and I included that. And some other incidences, and some of these incidences, yes, are there, of course, mine. But the, most of the book is totally fictional. Mm-hmm. And there are some incidences like once I was trying to dial uh, Amtrak uh, uh, phone number on, on a f- keypad, and at that point, I didn't know how to dial the letters on a keypad. Oh, because mm-hmm. I never did that. So mm-hmm. I was trying to dial 1-800-AMTRAK, and the phone went to some other, uh, you know, different line, which mm-hmm. is there in the book. So mm-hmm. that experience is exactly what happened with me. But there are very few things in the book which uh, it starts off as I have I have started here, but then it becomes purely fictional because I never lived in New York for most of my life, although in the beginning mm-hmm. I was. 
uh, but I've used a lot of experiences and uh, incidences from my friends, although, you know, some of them are kind of exaggerated or um, <laughs> added a few things to make them funny because if you mm-hmm. write the incident as it as it happened, although it, some of them were really funny, but to add a little bit spice into it, it makes more funny and more right. uh, mm-hmm. you know, enjoyable. Mm-hmm. 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 That is that is true, and I'm sure your friends get a kick out of. Uh, reading the story and going, hey, I, I think this little bit is about me and, and being able to, you know, see the, the little extras that you have added. I'm, I'm sure that's fun for them. Now, would you say that in in writing, some people um, say that they get writer's block or um, they have a really difficult time getting the ideas that are in their head onto the paper or onto the laptop, or onto the computer. Would mm-hmm. you say that you had any um, difficulties or anything? Did you, did you face any type of writer's block or anything when you were writing your book? Yeah, I mean, I've, I faced all possible difficulties which a first-time author or new author would feel. I mean, one of the most um, challenges, important challenges was how to find time, you know, because mm-hmm. you're busy. Uh, I'm I'm a full-time professional. Uh, I work most of the days of the week, sometimes weekends. Mm-hmm. So finding time was my most challenging uh, part of writing the book. Mm-hmm. Um, I used I started the book. I actually took a few days off and wrote uh, at least few pages, maybe about maybe 50, maybe 100. I don't remember. But then when I started working, the work came to standstill. I had ideas in my mind. Mm-hmm. So... Uh, at some point, I got so frustrated, I said, okay, there are 365 days a week, I mean, uh, in a year, and mm-hmm. if I can write one page every day, at least, then mm-hmm. you can potentially have a book a year. But mm-hmm. you know what? Practically, that's not possible. But I made it a point at some point that, okay, when I come home from work, I sit in front of the computer, and I write at least one page. Mm-hmm. And uh, it, it sounds very easy, but in practical life, it could be very difficult to do it. Yeah. And uh, believe me, you know, I, I used to come and there would be days and weeks we'd go by and I would get frustrated because I used to write them all the ideas uh, sometime in between the breaks that, okay, you need to add this in the book. Okay, this is the idea I thought about. We need to put it somewhere. And I couldn't mm-hmm. write it because there was no time. Mm-hmm. So finally, what happened is, okay, um, uh, Near the completion of the book, I said, okay, I need to work on this very seriously. I need one page per day, no matter what. And I started doing that, and then the things got getting started. And what is interesting is uh, sometimes I mentioned earlier that there would be a gap of a few days, even a few weeks, uh, when I would not write anything. And what was right. interesting is, uh, I don't know if it happens to all the authors, because I don't know, I'm a first-time author. I would sit in front of the computer, I open the last page, last paragraph and okay so we were on the Brooklyn Bridge and I would immediately reconnect to the story and start writing immediately mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and that was a very interesting thing which happened with me and I asked my friends who read the book that do you think that the, the story kind of feels incontinuous or like it has been written in you know in uh, different mm-hmm. time frames and they said no it, it, it's like continuous flow of story and uh, mm-hmm. I was really surprised with myself but because <laughs> After a gap of days and weeks to reconnect to the story and to write the story with the same flow, it's it's kind of difficult, at least for me. But mm-hmm. uh, yeah, that was the main uh, main challenge I faced. Other than that, you know, any any problems which a new author will face, like who do I, where do I look for the editor, who's going to publish the book, who's right. going to proofread mm-hmm. the book, all those challenges. Because mm-hmm. those who are in the industry, they know, okay, this guy is good, this guy is not good, don't go to this company. Mm-hmm. Um, the other thing was, uh, which was actually a mistake I did, is there are there are about 40 cartoons in the book, and I didn't start drawing the cartoons uh, till the end of the book. So I wrote, finished the book, and after that I got my iPad and Apple Pencil and started drawing all the cartoons. And I thought that was not very good because to draw uh, 
30, 40 cartoons at a stretch is not an easy task, you know, but <laughs> I should have, what I should have done is after one chapter, after two chapters, I should have sat down and looked at the storyline and, okay, this cartoon could go here and I could mm-hmm. have done that. But yeah, that was one of the challenging things because drawing 40 cartoons at a stretch, oh boy, believe me, it was, <laughs> it was quite a bit of work. Mm-hmm. 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 But I love how you say, you know, you were a first-time writer at, at that moment, and you just don't know what you don't know in in that moment. Now, when you, should you decide that you want to write another book or part two or, or however that may go, you have all these wonderful experiences and these memories of, oh, yeah, let me choose one, not two, or this time it should be purple, not green, or because you have all of these experiences under your belt. I like how I like yeah. how you said that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, one other thing I would like to mention is uh, when I finally found the editor online and uh, I emailed her, and she said, okay, send me the first chapter of the book because I want to know what you've written. And then mm-hmm. suddenly I realized, oh boy, I have not many chapters in the book. I just kept on writing and writing and writing. And oh, <laughs> there were no chapters. So I said, uh, to be frank with you, I don't have chapters, but I can send you a few pages. Uh-huh. And she said, okay, send a few pages to me. And then she looked at the, and she said, okay, I, I can do this. And you know, and then mm-hmm. we talked together, and then we made chapters in the book. So. Uh, mm-hmm. That one thing I realize is um, when I, if I, when I write my book, a sequel or a different book, uh, you know, I'm much more experienced now from my mistakes, and I, mm-hmm. I, I'm hoping I can do a better job. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I, I like how you said that. I shared a, um, a motivational quote the the other day on um, one of the social media platforms I'm on, and it says, you know, every day I win. Either I, um, or every day is a good day because either I win or I learn. And if you are able to take your moment of now and turn it into a memory, that's, especially if it's a positive one, then that moment is never forgotten. That moment is, is not only a teachable moment for you but for someone else because then you're able to share that information and you can um, have your moments where you may be the student but you also have the moments where you're the teacher. And I think that that's, mm-hmm. that's, really, that's really, really awesome. Now, BK, we are um, about in the last two minutes of our show, but I want to give you an opportunity to – uh, share a few things with with our our listeners, and one is is that is there a particular takeaway or is there a particular something that you would like for the readers of your book to leave with, or is there a particular bit of wisdom that you would like to share with our audience? Yeah, sure. Uh, I would like to tell the audience of your show or future readers of my book that um, it's a wonderful book uh, not because I've written it but I'm sure uh, everyone um, who reads will love it Um, I would urge your audience to grab a copy it's available on Amazon Barnes and Noble website Uh, if you want if you're looking like a hardcover or paperback copy uh, the book is also available on ebook format on Kindle, Nook, iBooks, or whatever platforms you read on um, uh, on your phone or your reading devices such as Kindle or iPad. It's a very right, it's a very uh, light read, and uh, once you start reading, you will get absorbed in the story, and just you know enjoy the book. And uh, somebody, um, one of the reviewers or somebody, one of my friends uh, wrote to me or he said to me that. Um, in a world which is full of so much hatred and negativity, you know, it's it's uh, enjoyable to get into the story, read the story about a young Indian doctor who comes to America and the funny incidences which happen with him. And it's it's like going into a different timeline or different uh, different world altogether, um, which is which is different and altogether. Uh, better than what we are currently living in, which, you know, sort of negativity mm-hmm. and sort of political nonsense, if I could say that, is going on, mm-hmm. you know. So I would just say that it's a light read. Uh, just grab a copy 
and enjoy it. Mm-hmm. You will love the book. Thank you so much for sharing your experience with not only with me but with my listeners as well. Thank you so much for being on the show today. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Thanks for having me. My pleasure. And listeners, thank you so much for joining me for Daily Spark with Dr. Angela today. I hope that you have an awesome, awesome day and that you have an awesome week as well. And as usual, may the Lord continue to shine His face upon you. May you receive grace and mercy in all that you do. Bye-bye.